hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Center for African Women Builders. Okay. Uh, basically, into women empowerment uh, educational projects, programs in our NGO. Uh, students' ability to be able to work after graduation because we discovered that the requisite skills that most graduates need to operate efficiently in the workplace is not really there after graduation so an opportunities for young graduates to be able to learn certain requisite skills so that uh, they can be more efficient in their workplace thank you okay thank you for sharing things hello amaka omaka one is Good morning. Good morning. All right, Ma. so we have uh, good morning. Fine. I have Varuna from Trinidad. Hello, how is Trinidad? Um, we have Bobo Benson. Just tell us where you're joining the webinar from in the chat area. If you'd like to share with us, at least we could interact for about five minutes um, before okay. we start the training proper. I'm Mamakawa Eze. I'm joining from Kogi State. Neighbor with neighbors without borders uh, foundation. That's our NGO. Okay, so what do you do? What program border. do you run? Yes. Although actually we have two NGOs, Neighbor Without Border and Quickaf for uh, foundation. We are into healthcare for uh, we are into healthcare. We help people to have to obtain a uh, real healthcare. Like on Friday, 26th November, we are preparing for a medical outreach in one of the interior villages in Kogi State here. We are in Ayemba right now. Ayimba. Then we are preparing for the World AIDS Day because PICAF is mainly for HIV uh, people. We, are, we search for HIV right. patients and take care of them. Thank you. All right, welcome. Nice to hear from you. Hello, Alu from Abuja. All right, so thank you for sharing. And um, I want us to use the chat area. We're going to do a quick poll. So if you have read, if you have never written a grant proposal before, respond in the chat area with a one. If you have written a proposal before and um, there's no positive feedback yet from the grant makers or the funders, respond with a two. But if you have written proposals and yes, you have um, some positive feedback, you've received grants before, respond with a three. So we we'll know um, the statistics, the dynamics of the participants we have this morning, if we have more of people that have never written a proposal before, or we have people that have written proposals and they've never gotten funding, or you've gotten funding, but um, you want to strengthen because we know that the landscape is changing, it's getting more competitive. So you want to be able to improve on your skills and then get more results for your organization. So one, if you have never written a proposal before, two, you've written a proposal with no positive feedback, and then three, you've had some positive feedback and you're seeking to strengthen um, the capacity of your organization in terms of grant writing. So we'll take a minute to see um, the spread. All right, we have a lot of ones. There we go. Okay, we have a lot of ones, a lot of two. I think it's a mix. We have a mix of participants. So um, we're going to facilitate the session to ensure that um, everybody is carried along. So I'll be sharing my um, slide shortly. But before we do that, I want to ask a question in terms of um, grant readiness. How many of us have the eligibility criteria? Let's say you have seen a call for proposal before by a funder, you have looked at the eligibility criteria, the guidelines, and then certainly you have 100% of what the donor is looking for. So if you have 100% of the eligibility um, structures required by donors respond with a one. And if you do not have your readiness system, the structures, 
specifically you don't have um, audited reports, you don't have policies, procedures, those are elements that do not look out for when they put out a call for proposal to see if you're structured. So you respond with a two if you don't have some of those or any of those, but if you have all of them 100%, respond with a one. Okay, in some cases it's 100%, in some cases we miss completely one to 95%. All right, thank you. Thank you everybody for engaging. And then we'll go right into the session. So welcome, good morning, everybody. This is the grant writing webinar. We're going to be deep diving into the fundamentals of grant writing, grant proposal writing. And we know that as NGO leaders, you're here either, you are the founder of the organization, you're the CEO, executive director, or just you have the responsibility of mobilizing funding or resources for the organization, either as the program coordinator, program manager, but you're here because you want to build the capacity to be able to attract um, the funding that you need for your organization. So thank you for joining. Um, a few ground rules, ensure that your mic is muted so that we have a clean delivery. Everybody can hear us. There is no sound from the background interfering with the session this morning. So ensure that your mics are all muted. Do a check on your devices to ensure that your mic is muted and we'll go ahead. So if you have a question or you have a comment to contribute to the session, you can use the hand raise button or you leave it in the chat area and intermittently we'll come back to it to um, respond to the questions and then the comments. All right, so welcome, welcome and thank you for joining. So why are you here? Like I was sharing earlier, I mentioned that um, you're here because you are a leader of a nonprofit because we're doing grant proposal writing and it's tailored for nonprofit organizations or NGOs. So you're here because you're passionate about making a difference in your community. You've seen a problem in your community that you intend to address through the work of your organization. And you also want to be able to expand the work you're doing you want to be able to scale up the work you're doing through added resources, which you want um, through the grant writing process, you want to be able to attract or assess grants and partnerships in order for you to serve the communities that you're serving or expand your coverage. You also want to develop the critical skills that you will need to be able to access these opportunities. Now, I always say that for you to get access to grants, whether it's cash grants or in-kind grants, the most critical skill that you need as a nonprofit leader is proposal writing. You should be able to put together what you want to do as an organization to a well-researched funder to increase the chances of you attracting the resources that you need to run your programs and deliver your projects and services to the communities. So my name is Ruth Kewe Ubiechesiri. For those of you that we've had some level of interactions before, Either you have attended my webinar or you've attended some of the courses, the coaching programs, um, strategy sessions with me and all of that. So it's good to see some of you again. But in case we're just meeting for the first time, my name is Ruke Obietesiri and I lead a consulting organization, Strategic Outcomes Consulting. And in this organization, we work with uh, basically nonprofit organizations leaders and we help them to build the capacities, strategic capacities and systems that they would need to become grant ready and then attract funding and partnership opportunities to advance their mission. Because as a nonprofit leader, you're mission driven, you're impact driven, you want to contribute to change in your community. And that is why you have decided to join a nonprofit organization or set up a nonprofit organization. So today we'll be looking at grant proposal rights and how do we begin to put together the work we do how do we begin to put together the request that we want to make asking for funding, asking for partnerships, asking for contributions from our ideal funders so that we can sustain the work we do as an organization. Now, for me, this journey started about um, 10, 11 years ago, started from a social enterprise and then 
working in the capacity of research, training, um, content development, training facilitation, and then in core programs delivery in inclusive governance and um, peace building. So one of the reasons or motivations for putting together a grant writing webinar and then grant writing mastery courses is because of the challenges that I had as a senior program coordinator in an organization about five, six years ago. And one of the core responsibilities I had, just like every other person in this room, is to be able to attract funding, attract grants to sustain the program um, we run in the organization. Basically, we're working on peace building and governance um, in the Niger Delta. And then I had the responsibility of writing proposals. But I noticed that over and over again, the proposals get they were all rejected. I think the first 20 to 25 proposals or so, some of them, we didn't even get any response from the donor if they wanted to work with us or not. And then you know that by, when you invest yourself in your organization, your writing proposals, you are very passionate about the work you do, but you don't get the outcomes that you really want to see. You expect to see a positive feedback from the donor because you believe you have written a well put together proposal, but at the end of the day, it's either rejected or the donor does not respond at all. And it was quite challenging because we had to pay salaries. There was no funding from anywhere to sustain the organization. And then people were going to lose their jobs. So one of the critical things I did was to invest in research, invest in research and building capacities. By now, we should have realized that nobody was born with a specific skill or capacity. Everything you have the ability to do now, at one point or the other in your life, you learned it, either from school, either from experience, from trying over and over again, either from coaching or mentorship, or you were observing as that, that activity was being carried out and you learned it. So what that means is that the skill of writing grant proposals to be able to attract funding for your organization can be learned. Nobody was born with that skill. So today I'm going to be taking us through a journey of how I went from, I would say a frustrated program coordinator, not being able to attract the funding we needed for our organization to supporting nonprofits across Africa and South America with capacity building and also with technical support to be able to attract funding. So in the last five years, directly and indirectly, we've been able to support the organizations we have worked for and worked with to mobilize well over a million dollars. And some of the lessons I'm going to be sharing with us in this webinar this morning. And if you're not in Nigeria, it's probably noon where you are. So there are three learning outcomes that we should expect from the next one hour or one hour, 30 minutes that we'll be spending together in this webinar. And the first thing is that you would get clear on how to seek and leverage on funding opportunities through grant proposals. Now, no matter how competitive the sector is, the truth is there are funding opportunities out there. There are funding opportunities for virtually any kind of program that you're running, provided it is in alignment with the sustainable development goals. So whether you are in the education space, whether you are in health, whether you are in gender, whether you are in poverty eradication or zero hunger or in the environment, there, is, there are virtually funding opportunities out there, grant makers, funders and partners putting out call for proposals to receive innovative ideas so that they can fund and then contribute to attaining the sustainable development goal. So one of the shifts that I want us to make in our minds this morning is that there are opportunities out there. Now, the question is, how do you build the competence? How do you build the capacity to be able to to be able to leverage or attract these opportunities and access the funding that you need to grow your organization. So we'll be gaining clarity on that area. And also we're going to understand the essentials of grant proposal writing. If you run an NGO, you have a nonprofit. This is one thing you cannot run away from. No matter how fantastic your programs are, if you want to attract the kind of funding that will give you leverage that will give you an unfair advantage to be able to grow your organization you should be thinking grants now there were a lot of funding funding sources 
and funding types to look out for from your fundraising to looking out for CSR partnerships and all of that. The bottom line is whatever funding channel you want to explore, whatever funding source you want to explore, one way or the other, you will be writing a proposal or pitching a proposal. So what are the fundamental elements of putting together your ideas and the work you do in order to get the feedback you want from your audience, whether grant makers or whoever it is that you want to write that proposal to. And you will also be gaining insight on what you should focus on in your organization in order for you to become grant ready. Earlier I had asked us, I think in the last poll, if you think that you have all of the eligibility systems, those readiness structures that you usually see in the call for proposal, if you have them 100% um, respond with a one, if you do not have them respond with two. And we have a mix of participants, people who are grant ready and people who are not grant ready. So we're going to be starting from that conversation. What grants means and what it means to be grant ready. Now, I have observed in the last couple of years working with nonprofits that there's, there's an assumption and a misconception about what grants are. So people see grants as free money, free money that should come to you because you are an NGO. So I really see some interesting conversations when people ask to say that I have just registered my TAC. Uh, uh, sorry, I've just registered my organization. If you're in Nigeria, you've completed the process uh, with the Corporate Affairs Commission. So you just expect that automatically one organization somewhere will send you an email and then you get grants. But that's not how it works in reality. That you have completed your registration is no yastic or guarantee that you are going to have grants. That's just one of the plenty processes that you need to consider in order for you to be able to get the funding that you need. So put your CAC registration aside. It's compulsory for you to have a legal identity, but it, it doesn't give you any edge in getting grants. So put that aside. So in practical terms, grants are no free money. It is not free funding for you to do what you like. Um, one, I, I was working with um, one of the executive officers in an organization, a thriving nonprofit, and she kept complaining how the founder of the organization had a wrong wrong assumption about grants. So they have spent a lot of money renting multi-million Naira office space, equipment and everything. And they were looking for grants to offset all of those expenses. And I said, there's no way you can offset that expense with a donor's grant because grant is not free money. It is actually an investment. It is an investment that a donor is making in your organization, in your program. For those of you that have attended either some of the grant readiness workshops we've had in the past, or even the last webinar we had last month on starting a grant ready um, organization, you heard me talk about this. It's for us to be able to be conscious in realistic terms what grant really is and how we can then position ourselves to be able to access this. So it is no free money, it is actually an investment. So because it is an investment, you must be able to show to funders, you must be able to show to donors that you are eligible or you have the credibility to receive this investment and create return. So anybody investing in something expects something in return. If you're investing in a business, you expect to make profit, you expect some level of return on investment after that transaction. And that is how we should begin to see grants so that we can begin to build the capacity, be ready, and position ourselves to be able to access this opportunity. So because you have a nonprofit, because you think you're doing fantastic program, it is not a yastic that you must receive grant, but it is how you position your organization, how you tell the stories about the work you do and how you will create change and create value for donors investment. I don't want to call it grant, for donors investment, that is what gives you an edge in order for you to be able to access these opportunities. Now I'm taking time to explain this because I want us to begin to shift our mindset and our perception of what this really is. So it is an investment, you have to show profit and that profit because you're an NGO, because you're a social enterprise or a non-profit, that return on investment in specific terms is impact. 
you have to be able to show impact. You have to be able to show that you are creating change, you are creating value, and you are solving problems for communities and for your stakeholders. So it is not about you being so passionate about the girl child. How are you creating value within that space? How are you able to show impact? That you went to a secondary school, mobilized 500 girls and did a two hour seminar is nothing in practical terms. But what specific change were you able to influence? Were you able to influence some level of awareness on specific issues like how they can protect themselves from sexual predators? What specific value did you create for these 500 girls? Did you give them information on how they can access justice in a case where they have been molested or violated? So the way you tell your story, the way you articulate what you do that creates value, that creates change, that leads to impact, that tells the story of the impact and solutions you're bringing in your community is one aspect of being grant ready. So if you can see my screen clearly, the slide steps clearly, you can see that I've actually outlined three specific areas where you must be grant ready in order for you to access funding. So whether you have access funding before or not, you know the space is changing, the space is dynamic. Donors are becoming very, very critical about what is really the return on investment on these grants that we have been giving over the years. We've given millions of dollars, millions of euros, hundreds of millions of pounds. What is changing within the development space on the African continent? These are questions that funders are beginning to ask. And then as implementing partners, because all of us here, we are implementing partners to these grant makers or funders. We need to begin to rethink what we do so that in clear terms, we can show that we're creating value in clear terms. So donors are investors. I want you to see them as investors, not people who just give you donations that you don't need to account for or you don't need to show value for, but see them as investors. That means if you're working with investors, you have to be accountable to show how their funding is leading to profit for them. Remember, it's social profit. So donors are investors seeking for social profit and then for you to access this investment and bring about this return, you must be ready in three perspectives. And the first perspective that you must show readiness is in your program innovation. I say it over and over again, for those of you that have been following me for a while, you will see that I always say in every session, it is not about your seminar, it is not about your workshops, it is not about your town hall meeting, your health outreaches and everything. It is about how that is leading to solving problems. So in showing or in demonstrating program innovation, you have to be very clear about the specific challenges, development challenges in the communities and the groups within the stakeholder groups that you're serving and how you are able to solve those problems. So if you're doing workshops for young people, sit down and begin to think these workshops, what problems uh, have we tailored this workshop to begin to address? What are the issues? And then how is our content addressing these issues? If you cannot answer that question, then you have not even started on the journey of being ready to assess the funding opportunities. Because you must show value for every dollar that the donor is going to give to you or the grant maker or investor is going to give to you. So we need to begin to rethink our programs and our projects. Don't just say that uh, well, we're helping vulnerable women and children. What specifically are you doing? What problems are you doing? You're doing community health. Community health is very broad. So for that specific proposal or the specific project that you want to do, are you going to focus on HIV? Are you going to focus on cancer? Are you going to focus on um, child and maternal mortality? Innovation, you must show how you're bringing your unique perspective in addressing the problems that you have identified. So one of the questions you have to ask, what problem am I solving? How am I solving this problem? What is the result? What is the outcome? What is the change that I'm able to influence as a result of these um, activities that we're going to be doing? Problem, solution, and the change. And then the second perspective that you must, um, the second perspective of readiness is your operational system. So as an NGO, 
sometimes I've, I've seen a lot of NGO leaders that um, are fully self-funded. So all of the money for programs and projects, activities, is either coming from the founder or maybe the board of directors or maybe just um, willing citizens that just like the work they do. But they are not accountable. There's no process that shows clearly how decisions are being taken in utilizing that funding. There's no track record of how monies are being spent. And then the reason that they usually give to me when I do a readiness audit is, and the money is coming from me, I'm practically funding the organization. Now you're missing out on opportunities because starting your organization, you're going to fund it. You're going to create some level of runway for your organization with your personal funding over time. But that particular period where you are self-funded is a period of readiness. It's a period where you build capacity to be able to be eligible for funding from grant makers. And so when you're spending your personal money your, from your business or from your job in running operations, you have to be very diligent in showing proof by keeping tracking every expense. You did a community outreach uh, um, activity. How much in specific terms was spent? You must be able to know exactly where every one dollar or where every one naira entered from transportation to maybe hotel accommodation. Let's say it's somewhere that is um, far away from your primary location. You spend stipends for volunteers, you bought refreshment. Everything should be well documented in a financial report, whether it is 100% funded by you as the founder or not because when you want to start applying for grants for those of you that responded with a one that you have never written a grant proposal before you are going to the donor is going to ask for your financial report so that they can assess to see okay what 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 what's the financial capacity of this organization what do they have the cap how much do they have the capacity to spend because an organization that has the capacity to spend five thousand dollars it does not have the capacity to spend one million dollars you don't have the structures you don't have the system to be able to get in that volume of funding and use it for programs you crash so you need to be able to track even as a self-funded organization your finances financial management is really very essential and then you need to have your policies spelled out how are decisions taken in the organization so the fact that you are, an, you are a business, as an NGO, you are a business organization. There's no different, much difference between you and a manufacturing company. There's no difference between you and a consulting, a business consulting firm. The only difference is that at the end of the financial year, you are not going to declare profit and share profit to your shareholders and stakeholders that, okay, we made a million dollars in profit, so you're not disbursing uh, uh, at the end of the year. That's the only difference. So whatever net surplus you have after from your from um, funding received and then your expenses is carried over to the next year and invested back into your programs. So that's the only difference. You're setting an organization up for social impact. But in doing social impact, you need money. You need funding. At least that's why everybody is here in this webinar. So you must have systems, functional systems. If someone wants to, you want to make a procurement, the most basic um, um, policies that you have, a policy like a procurement policy and HR policy, how do you hire staff? What are the systems in place to manage employee behavior, employee engagement and disengagement? What are the systems in place that guides your, 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 your funding? how funding is being utilized for procurement. So you just wake up one morning and decide you want to use um, Protier Hotel for an activity. And then you, as the head of the organization, you make a transfer to the hotel. If they give you receipts, if they don't, and then you can't even track expenses. So you must have procurement, no matter how simple it is, that shows a step-by-step -step process from when a request is being made to make a particular procurement or purchase to when it's been approved, to when a vendor is being engaged and all of that. The um, focus of this webinar is not really on structure and process, but it's on proposal writing. But these are areas that you must be ready. So if your organization operating without structure, without policies, without process, without financial systems, you want to do everything because 15 years down the line, you will not still be granted if you're still operating in the same way. 
And then the third perspective of readiness is visibility and strategic engagement. So you want to send a proposal to funders. For those of you that have been writing proposals before, you will see that in some of the forms, they'll, they'll ask for your website, office address, maybe social media handles and all of that. Now it is deliberate because they must do a due diligence check on you. They must check who is this organization? What are they about? Because your proposal can't really say everything about you. So they must do one or two checks to see, let's check out this organization. I think we like the idea, but let's see who they really are. So they check your website. What are, what are they saying on social media? And then when they do a search, they cannot find you anywhere. They cannot find anything about you anywhere. So it's like, it's difficult to make a funding decision because they can't see anything about you. That means even if they're putting money into your programs, you will not even be able to contribute to visibility for them, spreading the word about the work they're doing in your community or in your country. So visibility is really very important. Visibility is another word, marketing. So you must be marketing yourself as an NGO. Remember earlier I said there's no difference between you and a business organization. So since marketing is a critical component of business management or business operations, what it means for you as an NGO is that you must market your organization. So you, you may want to call it promotions, promoting your organization. It is, very, it is marketing. The long story short of it is marketing. You want people to be aware about what you're doing. You want people to be able to take an action to support you, maybe supporting your advocacy or maybe donating to your work, spreading the word, sharing um, uh, the work you're doing. It's all about marketing. So if you are not doing anything to market your NGO, you're just sitting down in the office uh, and you expect that miraculously, donors and stakeholders will just begin to see the work you're doing it doesn't happen so you must be intentional about getting yourself visible out there intentional about getting your work known so if i as a coach or as a consultant i was hiding in my office no form no no plan to make myself seen you will not hear about this webinar the emails you've been receiving from me, the uh, WhatsApp messages, the Facebook posts are all part of my marketing plan. To make people see what I do, since it's relevant for them, and also take an action so that I can help them through my programs and through my services. It's marketing. So as a nonprofit, you want to be able to attract grants. You want to be seen, easily seen, and uh, so that people can take positive action for you. You need to ensure that you're putting your word out there. You need to ensure that you're making yourself really visible and social media now is actually a very cheap platform for you to grow your visibility quickly. So it's a leveling playing ground. With social media, you can get your word out there. And then it's easy to find you when donors um, try to do a check on your organization. And then strategic engagement. Partnerships and grants will not just happen like that miraculously. You will not sit in your office, then just miraculously receive an email from USAID or DFID that you have received a grant of 10,000. I wish, I really wish that's how it works, but that's impossible. It doesn't work like that. So strategic engagement means how you deliberately make yourself visible to a funder or to a donor how you engage with the donors that are aligned with the work you do. So for some of you that uh, have been consistently attending my webinars and programs, you see I always talk about researching on the donors that are aligned with your mission. If you are in health, you have no business sending proposals to a climate change focused organization. No matter how fantastic that project idea is, you will not get a response. Or you're focused on um, entrepreneurship, then you are sending to a, 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 your proposal to an organization that is focused on cancer. I mean, it doesn't happen like that. So you must be deliberate in searching for the donors that are relevant for the work you do, understand what their eligibility requirement is for partnerships and funding, and follow it. Follow it from a point of value. So sometimes I see, when I send out emails, I see some responses from uh, people on my email list, and I'm like, you cannot come from a beggarly perspective. When you come from a beggarly perspective, what it, the, the vibes that you're sending to prospective donors and partners is that you don't have capacity. 
you're sending out a sending out the vibe that you don't have capacity you're not competent and so that's why you're begging it's about being strategic positioning yourself that you have the capacity to solve this problem and then you want to work with this organization to able to drive change and solutions in a perspective in a in a specific direction so it's not about sending an email begging that they should please help your position before your program shut down. They don't care about that, whether your program shut down or not. What they care about is that we are advancing the sustainable development goals. We are able to solve problems and improve the well-being of common people in rural communities, vulnerable people who, without these kind of interventions, will be left on the set. So your ability to show that, yes, you have the capacity you have the requirement, you are a credible organization that can do this, it's the foundation of your proposal writing. Whether you're sending emails out or you're writing well-structured um, responses to call for proposal. So you need to begin, to, why I'm spending time on this is that you need to think like a business. You need to think like a business that is going to bid for a contract. You're competing with other businesses. So you must show value. You must differentiate yourself from the pack. And when you come with a beggarly perspective, that email will be sent to trash or that proposal will be thrown away. Program innovation, operational systems, and then strategic engagement, visibility and strategic engagement. Even if the work you're doing is small, it is how you sell it that matters. How you sell it matters. How you tell your stories matters. So if you're just hiding, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to be out there, you know, we're just doing our own small, our own work by God's grace. You have to tell your stories and tell it well. So I, I have defined grant proposal writing in a certain way to help us really get a picture, a clear picture of where, where we should be looking at, how we should approach the proposal writing uh, um, process. So grant proposal writing is about communicating and pitching and articulating your unique solution. Um, if we're coming from the perspective of a unique solution, that means you have identified a clear problem. So you're, you're not a general person. You're, you're just doing everything general. No. Your proposal writing, in your proposal, you're communicating, you're pitching your unique solution to an ideal funder. In request for your grant or funding, whether it's in cash or in kind, so that you can implement that project in line with your interest, their strategic priorities, and their guidelines. I sat down to just think about it. How best can we put together this information to see that everybody in the room today will be able to understand what it is? So writing your proposal is not just writing about your project like that. There are specific perspectives or line of thinking that you must come from. One of them is that you must be communicating a solution. You must be able to show in your writing that this is a solution to an identified problem. You must be also able to show that this is unique. This is different. So you're not just trying to replicate what any other organization within the sector is doing. So there are NGOs in your community doing food drive. You too want to come and join to do food drive. So what, why should they fund you instead of the other organizations? So you must be communicating a unique solution and you must be communicating this to an ideal funder. An ideal funder is a grant maker, an organization that is supporting work around your mission, supporting work similar to what you're doing. So if you're working in child health, you are approach, your ideal funder is a grant maker that is supporting work in child and maternal health or have one of that, the things you're doing as part of their priority areas. So if you see a funder, for instance, like Act Foundation that is doing entrepreneurship, leadership, environment, and health, and then you bring something that's completely out of their focus areas, no matter how good your proposal is, it is not going to advance the objective. We are in a selfish world where we are looking out for ourselves. What's in it for me? So even that funder giving you money is also looking out for his own interests. As a funder, they have their own objectives. They have their own mission they want to advance. So anybody they are giving money to is someone that is helping them advance that mission. So your ideal funder is someone that your work aligns with, yes. 
So as you're doing your grand search, as, ensure that you are deliberate about who you're searching for. Look at their vision, look at the mission, look at your strategic plan to see that this work is similar or it has commonalities with what you do is an ideal funder. So in request for your project implementation, in line with your interest, like I've just explained, and then your strategic, strategic priorities. Every funder has a strategic priority for a specific period of time. So you look at a funder, for those of you that have been following for a while, for a period of time, I was talking about strategic planning, strategic plan. That's because it is your mirror of opportunities. So when you have a strategic plan that is well created, you have defined your result area, specific results you want to drive. It gives you clarity on the donors you, sh you should be searching for. So whose work, who is funding this work that I'm doing? What is their criteria? How can I meet up with that criteria? And then write a proposal to request for support for the kind of work that I'm also doing. So begin to think like a businessman looking for premium clients. So you're looking for premium funders. So that's just my little definition of what um, proposal writing is all about. And there are three perspectives of the process that must be in harmony, that must be balanced in order for you to write proposals that get the attention of the funders that you want to work with. The first perspective to your writing, writing your proposal, it is you. So as an applicant, as an NGO leader, you are actively looking for money because this conversation we're having today, it's about the money, it's about the cash. How can we get cash? to inject into our programs. And so the first perspective of this process, it is you. So as an applicant, you must demonstrate that you as an organization, you are credible and you are competent. Nobody will give you a, when I say nobody, I mean grant makers now, because it's about grant writing. I'm not talking about your friends and families, your followers on social media, that maybe when you pressurize them with so many pools, they just send 2000 or send $10 and all that. I'm not talking about those kind of people. I'm talking about institutional donors, the embassies in your country, the development agencies in your country, the development corporations in your country. Those are the organization, organizations that I'm talking about. So you must be able to show to this set of organizations that we call grant makers, that you are competent. By competence, you have the technical capacity to do the work. You have the technical capacity to solve the problems that your organization is addressing. So you're working around the environment. You must be able to come from a point of competence and technical capacity. It is not a pity party. Proposal writing is not a pity party process that uh, the organization is about to close. If you don't get this grant, you close. You close, though. You must be able to show that you're competent and then you have credibility. Remember when I was um, sharing with us about the three perspectives of readiness, the last slide before this one, I spoke about operational systems. So one of the ways that you show yourself as a credible organization is through your operational systems. When they see that you have internal control mechanisms in place, decisions are not just taken like that. There's a step by step, what we call standard operating procedures, there are SOPs that guide decisions around how money is spent, how staff is being recruited or disengaged, how our inventory, if you're managing inventory as an organization, how your storage inventory is being managed so that when you're using donors' money to make procurement of materials, let's say you have. Um, one of the programs you run is a food bank and IDP camps. So you're going to keep a lot of stock as an organization that's running a food bank, dry food and all of that. So you need to have a strong inventory management process in place that shows how inventory comes into the organization and how decision is being made for its dispatch or distribution. That is part of your personal procedure. So you must be able to show that you're a credible organization. Your financial reports, and so one of the things that the funder wants to see it will assess to check if you're a good match in your financial report, they now see your cost centers and the cost drivers. So they see that in your financial report, you are spending a lot of money on travels, flights, car hire, hotel accommodation, per diem, and very little proportion of 
your total revenue actually goes into implementing activities for your beneficiaries. It's a red flag. That is a red flag. So you're just showing that you are just there to flex, traveling, per diem, hotel accommodation. So you need to be very intentional about how you disperse money. And then it is supported through your process, your procedures, and all of that. More importantly is the technical capacity of the organization. As an NGO, and the way and in practical sense, NGOs are supposed to be innovative. You are a solution provider. You are supposed to be creating, creating new solutions to local problems. And for you to be innovative, it means you need to be spending a lot of resources, whether it's money, it's time, energy, on building capacity. For those of you that have had the opportunity of working with these institutional donors, you know that there's a lot of capacity building. You run projects, you're doing trainings, you're going for stakeholder dialogue, this or that. All of that is in building capacity and building competence. Because this capacity is what you need to be able to deliver innovative solutions. So you must be growing as an organization. You must invest in institutional learning. You must grow. In the last organization I worked with, we had a full team, a global team for institutional learning. The organization where we are always creating new frameworks to, to, to problems within um, the conflict, the, the conflict context. So you must have, you must be deliberate about growing your capacity as an institution, institutional capacity building. So it's not the time so the end, there's no money, you cannot invest in training and all of that. That's why you see smaller organizations, but because they are focusing on the most critical and strategic aspects of growth, they are assessing the opportunities out there. Why you that have been in the space for 10 years, you're still stunted. No institutional capacity development. So even if you're an organization that is operating on a shoestring budget, zero dollar, no budget, internet is there for you to learn. YouTube is there for you to learn. There are free resources that you can use. But more premium or tailored uh, uh, programs are being offered like coaches or an experts like myself. They are more suited where you can get hands-on support to grow quicker as an organization. So that's about credibility and competence. So in your proposal, you, every line you write in that proposal must be speaking the language of capacity, must be speaking the language of competence, meaning your proposal is showing deep knowledge about the problems you want to address, showing that you understand the issues. You also have the track record, the experience as an organization working on this. So sometimes I get questions, what do we do? We are, uh, we are just starting. Your starting phase is where you, you build you build muscle to be able to play in this field. So with the little, little self-funded um, projects that you're doing, ensure that it's, you're using it, you're learning, you're delivering solutions, and you're documenting the successes of what you're doing. So that's the first aspect of, of, of your proposal, the perspective of writing your proposal. You must demonstrate credibility and competence grow, build capacity, invest in institutional learning. And then the second perspective is your proposition. We have heard before our value proposition. Those of us that study small business, maybe you attended one marketing class or the other. It is still very relevant for your work. As an NGO, you are a business, only that you're not sharing profits. And so as a business, you must have a value proposition. What value are you creating? For stakeholders so in this proposal that you want to write what is the value what is the solution that you are proposing to the funder so your proposal is you pitching a solution so you must ensure that your solution is innovative like i said before don't try to replicate what other organizations are doing innovation comes from you looking at the problem in detail understanding the causal factors, the drivers of that problem. We'll see shortly when we want to talk about guidelines in creating um, your project. You must understand the problem. You cannot address a problem you don't understand. You must understand the problem in detail. Why is this problem existing? Who else is in this space trying to address this problem of cancer that we are working on? 
what are the root causes of child mortality in this particular retiree community? You understand the problem. And then from the problem, you will create a solution. So as an organization, you don't run away from problems. Problems are opportunities. They help you innovate. So when you identify a problem in the community, you understand it in deep, deeply. You then create projects or solutions that solve the problem from the roots. That's why you must understand the root cause. You must do a deep root cause analysis for the problem in your proposal. By the time we're looking at parts of the proposal, we we'll see when you're talking about justification, you must be able to show that you have knowledge and mastery of the problem. So your proposition, what you are bringing, the solution that you are bringing, saying that um, we are requesting for funding to be able to implement the solution must be innovative. It must be innovative and impact driven. So your proposition must be able to demonstrate how you are going to create impact, the specific impact you're delivering. Enough of the trainings and the workshops and the outreaches. If you cannot show the specific change value, the specific improvement, I think we'll be able, more, we'll be able to connect more with improvement. So what is going to improve as a result of this your solution? So let's take this webinar, for instance, as a project. So if this webinar is a project activity, which most of us do, all your town hall meetings and then your community outreach is where you're trying to pass information to communities. So if this webinar was a project activity, so what's going to improve? So one of the things that we improve is the understanding of the beneficiaries of this particular project on readiness. Decisions that they have to take to position the organization to attract funding. And one of the things they will have increased knowledge or increased capacity in writing grant proposals and therefore have the ability to attract funding into the organizations to drive their programs. So whatever you're doing has an effect. We know that one of the principles of life is cause and effect. So in the work you do, that principle is also at play, cause and effect. So you should be able to explain clearly what will be the effect of these activities that you're engaging in. What is going to be the effect of your project in the community? If you're doing a food drive, what's going to be the effect of food drive in the community? You must sit down and clearly communicate it in your proposal. And then the third perspective of your grant writing is the funder. So you can, even if you explain yourself very well, you have technical capacity, you have capacity of 10 years, you have collective expertise of your team for 50 years in the development sector, you have reached 10,000 people, you have taken 50 million people out of poverty. It will not matter if it's not aligned with the priority of the funder that you are sending that proposal to. So your funder is like your focus in writing your proposal. You must research that funder very well if they are an ideal fit for you. You don't send proposal. I still leaders telling me, when I ask you, what have you tried to do to raise funding for the organization? How have you done your proposal writing process? And we have just been sending proposal to everybody, organizations, when we do research online, we have sent proposal to everybody. And you are wondering why there's no feedback. So you are sending a proposal, I've mentioned it before, to a funder who is interested in the solution you're providing. And then if you are asking the question, how will I know a funder that is interested in what I'm doing? Study them. Every funder has a website. Look at their website, their mission. What is their mission saying? Every funder has a website that shows about us, who we are, what we do, our work, our priority areas of focus. You will, you will stay on that website like a Bible or Quran and then try to see what part time, what is this funder trying to do? And see if it speaks to your own work. If it does, then you look at their eligibility criteria for funding. What, what, how is their funding circle structured? It's not the time where you send unsolicited proposal. They have not, if it's an organization that works with um, grant circles, they, meaning at, a, at specific times of the year, 
they open up the funding circle. They put out a call for proposal, and then they put their specific guidelines. Well, organization, you must have, you must be a, a registered as a nonprofit, minimum of two years in existence, minimum one year audited report, and all of that. So you look at their guidelines and then the eligibility criteria. If it's a good fit, if you have them, then you go ahead and send an application. If you don't have them, it's not the time for you to go and sit down and say, we do not qualify. Ask your being strategic about, I think it's one of the webinars I'll do shortly, strategic leadership. It's not the time for you to go and sit down and say, we do not qualify. You ask yourself, what can we do in order for us to get these things that the, this particular funder needs to make a funding decision? If they are asking for audited reports and you do not have audited reports, that's the time to ask questions. How do we get our books audited? If you've not been keeping records, you try to I, you try to do a backlog, do an audit. Okay, what have, can we get maybe notes or other places where we have written our expenses? Can we clean them up, articulate them together, put them in an Excel sheet, get an accountant to help us look at our books? Get an accountant to help us look at our books and see how we can audit our books. So if you look at a funder, this funder is actually supporting the work you do, but you don't have one or two of the eligibility criteria. Find a way to begin to put things in place to get it over time. Give yourself a target. Oh, 2021 is already gone. At the end of 2022, I must have my first audited report. That means from day one, January 1st, if you spend $1 on airtime, you will document it. And if possible, get supporting documents for that expense, like a receipt or an invoice or something. So that you know that at the end of 2022, you're going to get an account and an auditor to audit your books. So these are the three perspectives, you, your proposition, and then your funder. So we'll be looking at aligning with your ideal funder. I've explained this before, but we're just going to get the wrong truth. So clarity on your mission. You see, as a nonprofit, you need to be very clear about who you are and what you do. Maybe over the years, because of you know trying to run around and pursue funding opportunities. So maybe you see that ah, there's a lot of attention on climate change like now. There's a lot of attention on climate change. How can we get into that space so that we can begin to get funding there? Then you run into climate change. And then you see that COVID happened last year. And then there's a lot of funding for community health. You run into community health and you have lost your identity as an organization. You have crept out of your mission. You no longer know who you are in clear terms. It's time for you to do a sit down and then get clear. Who are we really? What do we really want to focus on? What challenges, development challenges, do we really want to focus on that sticks to our convictions in this space, which is a strategic planning process? So you must do a strategic planning process so that you can be clear on the areas you want to focus on, on the change that you have structured your organization to begin to deliver through your programs, through your services, through the work you do. It's compulsory you must have a program model so that you don't begin to creep out of the work that you do. You know that where you see a call for proposal that is not in alignment with the strategic framework, you know that opportunity is not for you. Then you begin to search intentionally for the things that speak, speak to what you do as an organization. Then the second thing, mission alignment. Mission, you must be clear about your mission as you're researching your funders to work with them. You must be clear about how your work is aligning with that of the funder. So when you see a call for proposal, you see that it aligns, then you know that it's an opportunity that you want to pursue. And so eligibility. I've explained this before. Just wanted you to see it um, in clear terms. So mission clarity, mission alignment, and then you must build eligibility. Study that donor. Donors are not the same. So this the proposal you sent to Act Foundation may not work for MacArthur Foundation or Ford Foundation. You need to be clear, who are these funders? What are their priorities? And then they are circle. So if, for instance, you applied to, let's say you have sent a proposal to Ford Foundation and they did not ask of reference letters from the past funders that you have worked with before, don't take that approach to maybe a proposal that you see from UKA that after all, we didn't put um, reference letters. 
if UK aid is asking for reference letters from the past partners that you have worked before, you have to get it. All right. And so we're moving straight into practical terms, guiding principles for creating your proposal and concept design. So knowing that your proposal is a solution, a unique solution that you're tending to converse. The first thing, a proposal actually begins with a problem. Now, some of us, we have this orientation that a proposal begins with an idea. But the truth of the matter is this, if that idea is not solving a problem, nobody's going to fund it. If your the idea on which you have built your organization that you say this is innovative, if you don't know the problem that thing is solving, if it's not solving a pressing problem, it's not going to get funded. So the best place to start in thinking about your project proposal is clearly starting from a specific problem. So if that funder is supporting what around child and maternal health, okay, what specific problem around child and maternal health do we want to address? Is it access to health, uh, to, to um, quality health care for mother and child and children under five? So what specific, so your proposal begins with a clear problem that you are focused on addressing through the project you're going to create. And then you go further, if you've been able to identify this problem, for some of you here that I'm working with clearly um, at the strategic planning retreat, either at the standard or the premium level, you will know that I force you to drill down on the problem. I call that part the turbulent waters of the process. So you must be able to find the problem you are addressing. It, it's, it's interesting to see that we know a lot about what we want to do, the activities we want to do, who we want to work with. Then when we ask, Okay, so what is the problem here? People are lost. So you're starting from the problem. You must drill down and be able to frame the problem you are addressing. And then go deeper to understand the problem. Remember, when I was talking about the you perspective of the grant writing process, I said, you must know the problem. You must have mastery of the problem. So choose a specific problem and clearly map it how we want to work with women. And the problem here is that women are suffering from unprecedented levels of poverty. The question you have to ask is, how, what is the impact of poverty on this population of vulnerable women in this community that we want to work in? How are they experiencing the problem of poverty? What is the effect? What is the impact of this problem on this population? Because that is your project, uh, your proposal justification. So justify why the donor will give you more. Because your proposal is, you are, you are telling them why they should give you this $10,000 or why they should give you this $300,000 to support the work you do. So you must be able to justify that money. You are telling a donor $50,000 for this one year intervention. You must be able to bring forth your strong reasons why they should support it. And one of the ways to bring forth your strong reasons is really painting a clear and a compelling picture of how this population, how they are being affected by the problem. So COVID just happened last year. It's still a fresh memory. Look at the impact of COVID. People lost livelihoods. That period were on lockdown. A lot of SMEs closed down. So it impacted on the livelihood of citizens. Healthcare centers were being overrun. You remember the problem of, uh, what is it called? Is it the respirators or whatever, whatever that machine was called? Inadequ it was not adequate. So that was another impact of the problem. So you must understand the problem and define clearly how the population, because your proposal, you want to deliver a service to a specific population. If it's children, if it's women, if it's policy makers, young entrepreneurs, young uh, um, people in vulnerable communities, whoever this primary population you want to help or you want to serve through your project, you know the problem, the specific problem you want to address. How is this population being affected by the problem? That's one aspect. And then the other aspect, what are the root causes of the problem? 
we want to solve the problem of poverty in community A, B, C. Why is why does community A, B, C have unprecedented level of poverty and unemployment? You must be able to tell that story in your proposal. So that's where you're having conversations with community members comes in, interactions, participatory uh, sessions, where you are getting to understand the problem from the eyes of the population you want to support. So you don't design a project that will not get buy-in from the local community. You have a project that will not do anything on the ground because it's not relevant to that context. So in this community, I know sometimes we write, I see, we write proposals and it's looking like an academic paper. So your proposal is not an academic paper. It's all statistics, statistics, statistics without bringing on the ground practical elements of how the people you want to implement the project for are experiencing the problem. You must balance it. It should not be purely statistics and data that we can find on the internet and then nothing about what's happening on the ground. So you must explain, bring tangible experiences from the context you want to work with in that proposal. And then the second part, now that you have clearly mapped out the problem, which fits into your project justification, the other part is based on these issues that you have analyzed. You have broken the problem, you know the core problem, you know the impact, you know the root cause specific issues, um, driving or creating an enabling environment for this problem to thrive. You frame your project goal and objectives. Your project objectives will not come from another place. It will come from the problem. That's why I said your proposal begins with the problem. Your project goal and objectives will come directly from the problem. So now that you understand the core problem, addressing that core problem becomes the goal of the project. So what are the specific objectives of the problem? You look at the root causes. So why is there high level of poverty in this community? Okay, that's because um, there's no access to startup um, funding and, and um, skills development for young people to be able to go into business. You've been able to identify. So one of the objectives of your project can be to build entrepreneurial capacities for young people and then facilitate access to funding in order for them to initiate innovative essence. So you've just created a project from the problem. So your objective, as like I said earlier, doesn't come from outside. It comes from the problem. The solving the problem becomes the goal. So if the problem was high level of poverty among young people in community X, Y, Z, so your project goal will now become reducing poverty or decreasing poverty levels or mitigating poverty in community X, Y, Z. Then your project objectives, you've mapped out the root causes, you know the drivers. For you, for your project to be sustainable, for you to influence change, and really shift, create shifts in the community. Not you've just done another skill acquisition program that people are still poor. All NGOs are doing um, skills acquisition, poverty eradication. Poverty is still very high. It tells you that there's a technical, there's a systemic error in the way we have created our programs. So we need to look at it. In this specific community, why is the poverty level high? You may find that it's a problem of leadership. They actually have resources especially if it's an oil-bearing community like where I come from and where I've done most of my work over the last um, couple of years, you see that it's a community that is blessed with oil. They have money coming into the community every year in oil rent or benefits from IOCs, but you can't even find tap water in the community. So you know the problem is not far. It's a problem of leadership. It's a problem of greed and expansion in the community. So when you're designing a project to address, you are context specific. What is happening here, we address it from the root. Then we begin to build leadership capacities. That's the way you can bring people out of poverty. So based on the problem, frame your goal and objectives. And then you move further in designing your project. You develop activities that directly feed into your objectives. When I see some projects, I see a lot of activities that are not needed that are not necessary. It's not for everybody to have 15 activities in your project. So housekeeping, if your mic is open, can be stay muted till the interactive um, session. So you have crafted your goal and your objective. Remember that your goal and your objective must speak the language of change. 
it must speak the language and reflect the change that is going to happen, the improvement that is going to happen. You cannot be telling us that the objective of the project is to train 500 women. So what? If you train 500 women, so what, what's there? So what's going to happen? So you have to make it clear. You may know it as a team internally that when we train 500 women, they will not have the skills to set up small businesses. So what? That so what must be answered in the, in the way you have crafted your project goal and objectives. So it must reflect the change and the improvement that is expected to happen as a result of that work. And then now that you have your goal and your objectives all figured out, your activities must feed in directly into those objectives. If you're doing, if you want to strengthen income generation capacities of young people in vulnerable communities, maybe in a conflict reading community or an IDP camp, you must frame activities. Remember you did a root cause analysis. You mapped out the different issues causing the problem. Your activities must draw from the root cause to ensure that the activities you are picking are actions that will address the root causes of the problem. So one of the activities was that they don't have money. There's no money for them to buy equipment or buy materials in order to start their small scale business. So one of the activities you want to do, maybe either you're providing access to funding or you're giving them equipment and providing a support system for them to start the business and then they can take off. That is how to create a project that is bankable. Now, all of this, there's a tool there's a tool that is usually used to articulate um, your project design, but we're not going into that uh, today. So a lot, for some of you, you have heard about the log frame before. It's called a logical framework. It has many names, logical framework, log frame, logic model, results framework. It's still saying the same thing. So that's the tool that is used to articulate um, uh, your project concept. But for some of you, 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 you find out that as you write proposals, I usually advise do a log frame. So do your problem map and do a log frame from the beginning. And then from there, you can begin to populate the application form. So sometimes you see that there's a proposal and the donor is not requesting for log frame, logical framework. It does not mean that you shouldn't have, you should have a logical framework because that is from that log frame, you'll be able to answer the questions of risk that will be in the application form. It will I help you answer the question of um, monitoring and evaluation. It will help you answer the question of, for what else? Your outcomes, the outcomes that's going to happen as a result of your work. So you can research on that. For those of you that are joining mastery, the mastery program, you see that you're going to be creating your logical framework. So these three parts, fun, remember is the webinar is for the fundamentals. These three parts make up your proposal concept design. So you know the problem, you map the, the impact of the problem and then what are the factors driving the problem. Based on what you have mapped, you frame your project goal objectives. And this goal and objective must be reflecting the improvement that will have to happen. Your proposal is about communicating solutions, communicating the change, the results that um, will be delivered, what is going to improve for the communities and for the stakeholder groups that you'll be working with. And so, more importantly, or equally, you find after crafting that activities, you need to have a clear work plan, M&E plan and budget. The next um, slide, I'll be talk, working us through a basic proposal. What are the components of the basic proposal that you must have? So when you create your results chain, that's what it's called. When you create your results chain or your intervention logic that talks about the goals, the objectives or the outcomes, the outputs and then the activities. When you create that, in implementing the activities, you must be able to show a schedule over the life cycle of the project. Maybe it's a 12 month project, 18 months, 24 months, 36 months. However, whatever you are proposing to the donor, you want to do a two years project, you must be able to show over the period of two years, how will these activities be implemented? How will these outcomes be influenced? How will these objectives, how these objectives will be achieved over the lifetime of the project? If it's a two years project, even if it's a three month project, you must be able to say week one, this is what we do. So if it's a two years project, you may want to work on a month to month basis or quarterly basis. So you work plan, 
because some of the forms, application forms will ask you, okay, how are you going to implement um, this project over the period of time? Or they'll ask you, attach a work plan. Sometimes they even give you a work plan template, the table. Then you begin to fix in how you're going to the calendar. So it's just your, the work plan is just a calendar that shows you, you know, how this, how you have arranged these activities in a logical um, sequence and how they're going to be implemented over the life cycle of the project. And then your budget. So I was in a webinar some months back organized by one of the funders and someone asked a question. The person said I requested a proposal and then they cannot create a budget. And the facilitator, the focal person was asking how, how possible is that that you don't know your budget? What should go into the budget? You know what that tells, what that explains is that you are not clear about the solution you're bringing. You just need picked activities put there that you want to, um, uh, you want to implement. So there's no way that you have clearly defined the objectives of the project. You have clearly defined the activities you want to do, and then you cannot come up with the budget. Your budget is just a shopping list. All of us, we do budgeting. Right? We may not know that we're doing budgeting. You want to do your daughter's birthday party, or you want to do your wedding. You have a budget. How much you want to spend on food? How much you want to spend on drinks? How much you want to spend on entertainment and all of that? So budget is just a shopping list for your project. So if your project is said you want to train a hundred women on maybe tie and dye, for instance, and also give seed funding. Another activity is seed funding and equipment for startup to these women. You must have a monetary perspective of what you want to do. So you've written your proposal narrative. What is now the budget? For? What is the monetary implication of what you want to do? How much is it going to cost to do the training that you said you want? What are the resources that goes into that training? Okay. Let's say, for instance, you need consultants. How many consultants would you need to do the training? Training consultant, how many? Production of um, training manuals, for instance. You have to cost it. You need a venue for the training. What is the cost? Maybe your team will have to stay, be, be residential in a hotel for two or three nights. What is the cost of the hotel for one night? How many people will stay? What is the total? Salaries, um, how many staff do you need on the project? How many months will they be working? How much do you want to pay the staff on a month to month basis? You get the total. You want to buy equipment. What specific equipment do you want to give to support your population for their SMEs? How much does it cost? How many do you want to give? That, those are the things that go into your project. An admin charge, for instance, you pay rent. That is if the donor has, says in their eligibility criteria that they will cater to rent. So that's why you must look at the call for proposal and know what the donor will fund and what they will not fund. You look at the guide, that's, that guideline must read it very well before you even start writing. So you look at it and they, and they are telling you non-eligible activities. They're telling you they're not going to fund anything that has, has a political undertone. They're telling you that they're not going to fund alcoholic drinks. They're telling you they're not going to fund uh, your administrative expenses should not be more than 10% of the entire budget. So that's, it's restricted, you must follow it. So if admin, what are the administrative um, items that you need? Maybe um, the printer, maintenance of the printer. Uh, like now in my workspace, I'm running, I've been running generator for the last three hours, fueling and all of those things, generator maintenance, utility bill, internet, all of those things are administrative expenses that you use to support the implementation of the activities. What volume of those items do you need? What is the cost? These are the things that um, form your budget. So please, you cannot say, I uh, don't have an idea of the budget. What is the inference is that you don't even have an idea of what you want to do. It's just like you say, I want to cook soup. How much do you need to cook soup? You don't have an idea. You're not ready. You're not hungry. You don't want to cook. So your project, you must know clearly and communicate in the proposal in specific terms, the impact, the change you want to deliver these activities that will help you deliver that change and the resources you need to deliver it and the monetary implica implication 
of those resources. So what does a standard proposal look like? No matter how the donor wants to twist the application form, I've seen plenty application form and there are some essential elements. They tell you that across the lines, irrespective of who the donor is, there are some common things that every donor wants to see in the proposal. So however they twist the form, in a proposal, you have a summary. And this summary is um, an executive summary. So it's usually advisable that the executive summary, you should write it last. Though it's the first thing in the form, excuse me, one minute, please. Though the summary is the first thing in the form, but it should be the last thing you're writing because summary is synopsis of the entire proposal. This is a problem. This is the solution we're bringing. These are, this is our experience. This is why we are positioned to deliver this project. And then this is the amount we are requesting for. Executive summary. So you should do this, the final thing that you should do when writing the proposal, because you want to figure out understanding the problem, creating the solution, doing all of that. And then you will not get a summary, which becomes a proposal summary. So that's the first part of the proposal, but please, the last thing you should write. Then project justification. I was reviewing a proposal, I'll just run straight to the project justification to see why should this person be giving money. So over the weekend, uh, um, there was an opportunity to sit on a panel for young entrepreneurs that were pitching for a grant. And then it did, we had some commonalities. Why should we give you the money? Let's see how they're able to articulate and pitch um, the, the, the problem that their business is going to be solving. Okay, what's their unique model? What business model are they going to be running on? What do they want to use the money to do if we're giving them that money? So whether it's a pitch, you are, a donor has invited you for a face-to-face -face meeting or a Zoom meeting, it's this proposal that you're going to be doing, whether it's written or verbal, these components are really very important. So a project justification is why should we give you money? And why the donor should give you money is how pressing that problem is, how you understand the problem, how community members are being affected by the problem. That you do, when we ascertain, check the problem, we'll know if this thing is urgent or it's just a fancy project that you are bringing to the table. So project justification is an in-depth analysis of the problem, how community members, so in putting your justification, you must be very detailed within the character or word limits that the proposal has given to you. So you see a proposal, maybe they say 500, 500 word limits for the project justification or the project justification is the same thing as your problem analysis or the problem statement. So within that 500 words limit you've been given or 300 character limits, whatever, it must capture the problem, how the, the problem, the population, how the population is being affected by the problem and then the causal factors of the problem, explaining why it is essential for us to begin to address these root causes through this project. So that's the why. Your why is the project justification and explain in detail the, as the essential elements of the problem like I've just explained it while ago. Then your methodology, the same thing as um, your proposal summary or your project summary, executive summary is different from the project summary. Methodology, this is how you intend to solve the problem. And your methodology is simply the project goal, objectives, all the outcomes, your outputs, your activities. So it's actually a chain, it's sequential. So the project goal, these objectives will be contributing to the goal, these outputs will be contributing to the objective, these activities, that's how it is framed. So it is your unique solution. All the things I've said about creating your goal objectives and all of that, the activities, this is where you explain it. You say, this is the goal of the project. This is the objectives are the outcomes that I want to achieve. These are the activities. Each of the activities, depending on the space in the form, you explain what you're doing under each activity. You don't just say workshop, 
what about it so what you want to do a workshop so what you must explain in that workshop exactly what you are trying to do what would this work what would you teach in the workshop what's the content of the workshop why have and um, what knowledge or awareness and capabilities will this workshop deliver explaining each of your activities depending on this uh, limit that the donor has given to you the monitoring evaluation and sustainability see you a result you must be able to monitor and evaluate whether you are achieving your outcomes you have specified certain objectives that you want to achieve with the project you have specified certain outcomes for the project okay that's fine but you must be able to tell us how you are going to show that you are really achieving these outcomes through your um through the project activity so monitoring and evaluation, you are tracking, monitoring, how are we covering the activities right on time? Are we reaching the number of people we say we want to reach? And then evaluation, we have done a workshop, a training. And it was our intention for that training that this population, the women, the 100 women, will start up small businesses at the end of the training. Now, we, have, we did that training four months ago. How many of them? have been able to start up the business. Those that started, what's the extent to the profitability of that business or viability of the business? These are the things that separate your organization. Even when you are capturing your impacts, let's say on that capabilities, you're saying we have done this. Stop talking about your activities. Stop talking about the change and the impact to what extent that those activities are impacted on your population. Yes, you train 100 women, that's fine, 100 women train. And then you're going to tell us that 70% or 80% of these women train have gone ahead to start up their business, are now running profitable SMEs and able to cater to their basic needs for their families. Evaluation, you must be able to show that this is how you're going to track to ensure that you are delivering on the outcomes. Then sustainability, how will this project be sustained when the grant ends? Every grant has an expiry date. The last one project I worked on, we're so excited. We were a very massive project, over 1.6 million euros. But we were looking at our calendar because that project was to end December 30. It ended, no matter how we prayed that the project should continue, it still ended. So every project will end. So when the fund, funding, the financing, of this project ends, what is going to happen? What have you put in place in order to ensure that the benefits that the project delivered, we continue to deliver that benefit. It's maintained in the community. So you must think through, okay, um, we, we have, that's why you must diversify your funding model, not just relying on only grants, but board members are donating, we're doing fundraising online. So we'll be able to sustain this and this component part of the project. And then you have put up uh, maybe a vanguard in the community or structures in the community that will now carry on, whatever it is you have decided for it to be. Capacity statements, I don't think we need to dwell on that again. Because on the you perspective of grant writing, I mentioned that you must be able to show competence and credibility. And for you to do that, it is your expertise. So you must demonstrate in the proposal that you have knowledge in this area, you have real field experience. You are mentioning projects. You're mentioning interventions that you have done before, the funders that you worked with, the results, the impact, summary of the impact that was achieved, success stories that you can pick from it. So what have you achieved over time? And what do you strive and aspire for, for as an organization? Budget, we have explained, this is the financial implication of the project in monetary terms. So we've we'll run through about an hour, 30 minutes for the webinar. And then I know it, it's a lot of information that we have um, consumed. Some of these things, some of us are aware, maybe we're not intentional about the implementation of it. So before um, <clears throat> we get into, you can leave your questions in the chat area. I've been looking at the, uh, the chat area from time to time to see if there were questions. So beyond those of us that were requesting for um, the recording and all of that, I can't really find um, any question in the chat area. So I'm going. I'm giving us an, inter an invitation to join the grant writing mastery course. 
Now, the essence of this webinar was to give us the fundamentals. These are the fundamental part of writing a grant proposal. Now, if you think this is sufficient for you, you can run with this and write your proposal. Interesting, I'm waiting to hear um, the success story. Just like um, for those of you that have been in my space for quite a while, you've seen that of late, some of the first cohort of the grant writing mastery course we had, we had uh, some of them um, getting, being able to get funding from the proposals that we worked on in the course. Some of them got $5,000, $5,000, 20,000, 20,000 pounds and 15,000 dollars. That's some of the things um, that we have explained. So someone is asking, what do you mean by theory of change in a proposal? Okay, theory of change now, let, let me take you back to um, the slide that talked about um, creating your proposal concept. So I said your goal, your objectives, and then your objectives must be reflecting change. In simple terms, theory of change means how change is going to happen. And then it is a hypothesis. Theory of change is a hypothesis of how you're going to make change happen or how that problem is going to be solved. And it is usually framed in an if and then statement. Meaning, in simple terms, if we do this and this happens, eventually, then this is going to happen. So if we provide capacity building to vulnerable women in XYZ com communities, and the women are able to see the if, if we do this and this happens, if we provide this capacity building to uh, vulnerable women in this community, and the women are able to initiate small scale enterprises that generate $200 in revenue on a weekly basis, I'm just giving some of the, of the heart, then they will be able to cater for their basic needs and then come up maybe from below the poverty line. So theory of change is simply one line statement or a short paragraph. The premise on which the entire project sits on, the entire summary of your project, how change is going to happen. If we do this and this happens, then eventually we're going to get this um, outcome or this ultimate impact, okay? So that's what it is, what is it doing? Those of us that did the project thesis in the university, you remember that your project, your uh, thesis had hypothesis statement. So the hypothesis of your project is what a theory of change is. And so I was talking about the invitation to join um, the Grant Writing Mastery course. It's actually a coaching program over a period of one month. So it is beyond training. It's not only training because the training resources have already been created in the course which are the training videos, each of the modules, each of the modules are handled within two hours master classes. So the grant writing mastery course is actually a four weeks program where we learn and implement all that I've shared here, working with you on it. So in the first week, we're going to be looking at understanding donor interest and community needs. Remember where I was training for the last one hour, 30 minutes, I explained how you have to align with donor funding. PW is co-work, co-work session. CRO training, when the trainings will be delivered and then where we're going to have the co-work session. So I explained how you to align yourself with the donor priorities and all of that, then how to understand community needs. So in the grant writing mastery, you are in the fundamental class, fundamental mystery. Grant writing mastery has different levels of access. So you have learned the fundamental part. So in the mastery course, you're going to be doing a, that's where you're going to see problem tree mapping, all of the impact mapping, and then the problem, um, the root cause analysis. That's where you're going to see the logical framework analysis and all of that. So the first week, what we're going to do you're going to, we're going to give you a call for proposal. I usually use a past call for proposal from US Embassy Abuja. That's what I've used for the previous cohort. And it's, it's a perfect fit to use for practicals and implementation. 
So in the first week, in the grant writing mastery course, TRO means training. So you're going to receive the training for that particular module. You're going to be onboarded to the course for those of you that are going to enroll. You're going to receive the training. You go through that specific masterclass and then you implement using the call for proposal that we're giving to you and the proposal template. You're going to do an analysis. You're going to do an analysis of the problem in the community you're going to focus on and come up with your project justification. Then the co-work session, how the first, there are some people, I think there are some people here that have attended, um, that have gone through the course. In the co-work session, it's not training. We're brainstorming and pitching. So you're going to be pitching what you have done. And then I and my colleague, I and a summer of uh, my associate, when they are available for that particular period, we'll be looking at what you have done and helping you strengthen it. So that's what co-work means. We're working together to strengthen the proposal. I have remodeled the program in a way that it forces you to take action. It, you must have a completed proposal at the end of the course. So that's what um, one of the participants, Mohammed Husseini, did, which he was um, awarded $5,000 for um, two weeks ago when he sent me uh, the congratulatory email. So you are going to do, it will force you to do the work and it will be strengthened by experts to make it better. So the, for the first week. Week two is a project design and narrative writing. So you go through the training, the masterclass for project design and narrative writing before it used to be live. Then now we already have the re resources hosted. So you go to the masterclass for the project design and narrative writing, and then you create your logical framework and you bring it to the co-work session. You come and pitch it again. And then together, we will strengthen the logical framework. So you learn by doing. At the end of the course, at the end of the four weeks, you have a refined, completed proposal. Week three, you're going to create your monitor evaluation um, um, plan. You're going to create your sustainability plan, unique to that proposal that you have written. And week four, you're going to create your budget. So at the end of the week, everybody has a completed proposal. Now, I have eligibility criteria. It's not everybody that is going to be admitted into the course. So I've learned lessons from the different programs I've been running. So if for people who are so, who do not take action, when they say do your coursework, you will not do it. You, you are never available for live sessions. You cannot bring yourself to read the resources. Let's say maybe the call for proposal. You cannot even download the application form. If the program is not for you. So grant writing mastery is for NGO leaders who are ready to write proposal to a donor today. You are ready to go forward write your grant proposal, submit to donors in order for you to be able to assess funding that you need. You are teachable. These are the qualities of the people that is application is open for into the grant writing mastery course. So we don't want people who sit in a program, they won't show up for live sessions, they won't follow, uh, uh, come put their proposal together to pitch it. How can you learn? How will you get money? Because we're doing, we're talking about money here. And nobody will dash you money. You have to bring forth your strong reasons. So how do you create a proposal that gets you the money? So it's a four week of, of work. Every week we're creating part of the proposal. And at the final week, week four, you have a completed proposal that um, you can go ahead to submit, which people did and they got money. In one week, the good news I had was over $50,000. I'm still reveling you know, in um, the impact of that work that you have done. And so what are the access levels to the um, course? But before I talk about the access levels, we have expected outcomes. What would you achieve? What specific tangible milestones in learning, in understanding, in capabilities will you achieve from participating in the grant writing mastery course? So the first thing is that you'll be able to align with donors' interests. When you write your proposals, you are able to align with donors' interests and priorities and the needs of the communities well articulated in your funding proposals. You'd also be able to design projects that are impact and results driven, that speak the language of results, that will attract positive funding decisions for your organization. 
The third outcome for you is that you'll be able to create ME, monitoring and evaluation frameworks, sustainability plans and strategies that will strengthen your case for funding when you're creating a proposal. You'll be able to develop comprehensive projects for the work you do. And so the weekly strategy session, because like I said, this is fundamentals, it's open, it's all the information, talk, 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 talk. I've structured all of my programs in a way that they are co-work sessions. They are strategy sessions where you have tangible things that you're creating out of the program. And you're creating a strategic framework or you're creating a strategic plan, you're creating a proposal that you have um, access to my support over the period of time in the course. So the weekly strategy sessions are open for that period of time where you get hands-on coaching and then proposal strategy support to strengthen and refine your proposal. So who should apply? People who are ready to submit a proposal now, now, now for an identified funder. Not that you just want to learn it and you keep two years time, you have not written any proposal. No, we have leaders who actively want to start exploring grant writing to get funding. These are the category of people that the program is open for. And then we have three levels of access. Some of you that have been coming, you know that definitely at the end of the webinar, I'll give you an opportunity, introduce you to the structure through which I work with organizations and work with people at different levels depending uh, on your budget and capacity part time. So everybody is going to get onboarded to the grant proposal writing toolkit. I took time to create the toolkit. I've always refined and improved on it. Like Bobo Benson that here he said he has gone through the course. What you had, the old version of the toolkit. So there's a lot that has gone on within the proposal writing toolkit over the last couple of months. So in the proposal writing toolkit, we have the course, the online course, or the video course series on proposal writing, different master classes that you go through per time or per week within the proposal writing toolkit. In the proposal writing toolkit, you have an ebook on writing grant proposal. It's a 65 page ebook that contains step by step all of the templates, everything within it in creating a proposal. For those of us that like reading, quick reads, it's just something you go through and then you have the content you need for writing a proposal. You have a brainstorming prompt, which is the proposal planning template. So in a team, I usually say you want to write a proposal, don't do one man show of proposal. Let other eyes and thoughts come into the writing. You have a rich um, process when you work with your team, either your team of volunteers, staff, you know, other people who share thoughts with you within the organization to brainstorm. So we have a prompt, there are a couple of questions that I've created. I reflected on my process of writing proposals. What do I reflect on when I create proposals? So we have the proposal planning template, it's a brainstorming tool. So by the time you, you use that for your brainstorming sessions as in the group sessions where you're trying to respond to a call for proposal, it takes you to step by step how what you should focus on, look out for in the donor criteria and all of that, how to reflect on the problem analysis, all that I've shown you step by step, it's a guide for brainstorming. And then you also have a funded proposal. So I shared the first successful proposal that I wrote after Plenty Plenty in Wahala. The first successful proposal was a UK aid funded, um, UK aid funded project, and it was for 98,000 pounds. That was, I think, four years ago or so. Um, 98,000 pounds. So I shared the proposal framework so that you see how you articulate, what, how you present your case. So it's one thing to have it in your head, it's another thing to be able to communicate it in writing. So what was the writing style or how the, that proposal was put together that we're able to get that um, result from UK in 98,000 pounds. So that, that, that is inside the toolkit. So they, you know how a toolbox looks like with the screwdrivers, spanners, nails and everything. So that is what the proposal writing toolkit is. So whatever level that you are enrolling for, you get the toolkit. So at the highest level is the premium access. This is not new to some of you that, you know, I've always been popping into my webinars. So at the premium access level, you it's, I'm working with your organization. So it's a corporate level training. So for your organization, for your team. So the, the support is tailored to you. You're not within a group where you are having different perspectives, but it's tailored for your organization. You're working with your organization for that. And then 
premium access, we are going to have weekly strategy sessions. You're getting, everybody's going to watch the training sessions. Then we'll have review of the training and then we'll have strategy session practically to start creating different parts of the proposal. And that's for $500 for four weeks. And then at the standard level is the group program. And the standard level is only open to 12 people. I want it small and I want it intimate. So within this group of 12, that's where everybody will be pitching, working on their different proposals, we're having the strategy session, just like it's currently ongoing for the strategic planning retreat. We have about 10 people in the retreat that have been supporting um, weekly. So standard access, you have the weekly group co-work session. So you're pitching, it's like a pitch competition and all of that, creating that environment to really help you think about your proposal and create something uh, innovative like we've done with the other um, cohorts. And so that's what's going to happen at the group level is $100. If you are in Nigeria, I've actually pegged it, the exchange rate at 500 Naira. I know it's more than that. So if you're in Nigeria, standard access is 50,000 Naira. If you're an, inter an international participant, is $100. And then for the premium access level, if you're in Nigeria, it's 250,000 Naira. And then if you're an international participant, it's $500. And the basic access, you get the toolkit um, only. So let's say you're strapped for, for budget at this particular time, but you really want to build the capacity of your organization in terms of proposal writing. And so you can get the basic access, $40. And then if you're in Nigeria, that should come up to 20,000 Naira with um, the exchange rate that I've fixed it at. So these are the three ways that we can work together on building your proposal writing skills. So if the webinar is okay. I know there are a lot of smart people who can just get information like that, run with it, and then create results. One of the guys that had outstanding results was just in a webinar like this too. So basic access, you get the two kits only. Um, it, the link is there. And also for standard access, you're in a group, we're working co-work sessions. Premium access is one-on-one. -on -one. So somebody was asking that, um, what if it's you, just one person uh, in the organization, it's the same thing. It's the same thing for one person. The focus is just on you, on your specific needs. Uh, um, that's essentially it, that's pretty much it. So $500, if you want me to work with you at the personal level, one-on-one -on -one with you or your organization, $500. And then standard access is $100. And then basic access is $40. So I'm going to be putting in an application form or the registration form, whichever way you want to call it. It's just a Google form that captures um, a bit details of you, your organization, the preferred level that you would want to enroll in and all of those information so that we can get in people um, who want that. So it's there in the chat area. I've just sent in the application form or you want to call it registration form so you go ahead if you want to enroll any of the access levels that you prefer the details are there so it will open on a month-to-month -month basis the first or well, the new cohort is next month from december 7th to december 28th so the first session is december 7th and then we close 28 just well over christmas we know it's christmas but we know as ngo people we don't rest Christmas, a donor is asking you for annual report, project closeout report. So we know how it is in the sector. We're, we're eating and then we're, we're working at the same time. But we're going to close out uh, December 28th. It's just once a week physical strategy meetings and then email support and all of that. So the, the application form is there in the chat area if you want to enroll so that we can capture your details, we can capture your preferred cohort, we can capture um, the access level that, that really speaks to your need as an organization. So if you want, oh, let it be tailored to just me and my team, you know that the most people want is premium access level. Then you want to be in the group because of your budget and all that. 12 people for the standard access level, it's $100 and then, Basically, so for those early birds, for those that are going to be registering or enrolling between now and then December 1st, which is one week. So for those of us um, enrolling from now to December 1st, early bird bonuses 
for those of you that's getting into the standard access, you're going to have one personal proposal strategy session. You know, I mentioned it's going to be in a group, but for early birds, we'll have one one-on-one -on -one session with you on um, to figure out your, your donor mapping, the donors that you can look out for, give you that personal question, our strategy session, personal uh, thoughts on your work. Then for those of you that are enrolling in premium access level um, for the early bird, you're going to get a strategy session that focuses on impact reporting because impact reporting really fits into the quality of your proposal. So it's going to focus on impact reporting and then your grant readiness audit to look at your structures, look at your processes, look at your policies to see if you're grant ready and give our recommendations um, and uh, advisory on the things that you need to do to strengthen that and value that $200. You're going to be getting that for free, no additional cost. So for those of you getting early bed, that's it. So the application form is there. Um, I hope that it's visible for all of us to see. So if you're in Nigeria, premium, five, we know the exchange rate is 570 something or 560 something, but I've taken it at 500 Naira to a dollar. So if you're in Nigeria, Premium is 250000 for just you or you and your team. In standard access, $100 is 50 k if you are in Nigeria. Then the basic, which is just the two kit. Two kit has the, all of the trainings, all the master classes, they are there. The, everything is inside. Your proposal prompt, the e-books, the sample funded proposal is there in the two kit. The email will be delivered to you. Everything, you have access to the course and the password and you have the links to download all the other materials, you have lifetime access to um, the resource. So if you're in Nigeria, it's 20K for basic, 50K for the standard, and then 250K for the premium. So the application, um, the form, the Google form to capture your enrollment details is there um, in the chat area. So I'll post it again because um, sometimes when chats come in, we we'll lose it, so it's there. And now we're going to take questions. So if you have questions, go ahead and um, let's 